and welcome back to Migration Season 2, Episode 9. Today, we are talking about the concept of being in two places at the same time. Bilocation. Bilocation is something that is straight out of comic books or science fiction, but is it possible? Is it possible for you to actually be in multiple places at the same time? And for the purposes of this discussion, we're talking one's consciousness being in two places at once. The notion that the source of your very awareness can be in more than one place. And what are the major implications for that as a species? Now, if you personally want to investigate the concept of your physical body possibly being in more than one place at a time, I'm going to direct you to two areas of study in physics. I would check out Entanglement and the Many Worlds Theory, which we will come back around to a little bit later. Those appear to be the best scientific routes to get physical matter in two places, but I cannot say I have any personal experience in something like that happening. I really can't speak to the possibilities of physical bilocation. Uh, that may be actually totally impossible. I'm, I'm really not sure. So, get comfortable, smoke them if you got them, and get ready for today's episode of Migration. So those of you who found me on radio or podcast shows over the years know that I have personal experience with consciously being in two places uh, at the same time. And the experience was so deeply unsettling that I pulled back and I stopped going into lucid dream states and astral projection altogether for months on end. This experience traumatized me more than anything else I had ever witnessed in these experiences of non-localized consciousness. And it, it took years for me to understand why exactly. And it took me even longer to realize that this experience we're covering today now appears to me to be the most important experience I've ever had out of hundreds of similar experiences. And this part, may be hard to swallow if you don't have first-hand experience in this realm at all. It would have been far less traumatizing for me had I suddenly found my actual physical body in two places at once. You've got to understand, that's, that's because at the time I had this experience, I was already starting to become more comfortable with the idea that whatever it is that I'm made of, it's something that can come and go out of the physical body. So what I identify as me is something else, a, a, perhaps a point of awareness. So then to find that the simple notion of being a single point of awareness in one place, in one time, wasn't true either. It forced me to realize I really wasn't something solid, like a, a tangible, a reliable matter of some sort. And all I can say is that is terribly frightening to find out that what you thought you were at the core is not at all what you ever imagined. Uh, that was that was quite terrifying. So this discussion may sound like like offhanded paranormal spooky talk, but it points us back to perhaps the most important, profound question we can tackle as conscious beings living life as flesh and blood characters. It, it speaks to what we are at the core. You know, the word soul is thrown around often very loosely in religious and spiritual circles, but what do we really mean by a soul? Some, some of us might say it's what we truly are, you know, at the core, the larger awareness behind, behind our eyes. Some may picture this soul as some sort of amorphous ball of energy like, like I used to, you know, something that rises up out of your body when you die. Now, of course, I don't subscribe to this particular concept uh, any longer, and we're going to explore why that is so important. So as you may have guessed, there is one heck of a history behind the idea of bilocation. Uh, 
There's quite a history of those who have claimed to have either personally experienced or have witnessed others being physically or consciously in more than one location at once. Uh, Muslim Sufis, shaman, monks, witches, and even Christian saints have been attributed with the power of bilocation. One of the earliest myths known as Our Lady of the Pillar, for example, tells, tells us of the story of Mother Mary appearing as an apparition to the Apostle James the Greater in 40 AD while he was in Spain and while Mary was still alive and well in Jerusalem. So what I did not expect to find when I started doing my research into bilocation was uh, I didn't expect to find a modern scientific study on it. Uh, so here's a study called The Bilocated Mind, New Perspectives on Self-Localization and Self-Identification. I've linked this article below because it is fascinating and it's very bizarre. They try to break down the phenomenon from a more neurological and psychological perspective, but apparently the experience of what they refer to as heteroscopy, I, I'm not positive if I'm pronouncing that right. I've only seen the word written. I've never heard it pronounced before. So you take a look at it. Tell me in the comments if I'm totally screwing that word up. He he heteroscopy? It's the act of witnessing yourself in two places at once. And apparently uh, this, this phenomenon is really fairly common. They talk about possible areas of the brain even that might even process this experience. In the end, they concluded that regardless of how real these experiences are from a strict neurological perspective, bilocation is indeed something that people claim to experience fairly regularly. So I'm going to try to do my best to explain what this was like when this happened to me, but I, I'm ultimately going to fail because there's really no way to illustrate how this actually played out. It's so abstract. Your brain is really not generally wired to even take in this kind of information, but I'm going to do the best that I can. So the first time this happened to me, I was in my early 20s and it was probably around six in the morning. I was visiting my folks uh, on holiday from college. Both of my parents were already awake and they were getting ready for work when I entered a lucid dream state. I became fully conscious and, I, and yet I could feel my body was still totally fast asleep. This, this is a state called sleep paralysis and it is a perfectly natural state the body generally enters during REM that can be terrifying to consciously find yourself in until you learn to stop fighting it. If, uh, if you've not experienced sleep paralysis, imagine waking up trapped in a dead body that can't move. It's, it's absolutely horrible. Uh, it's, uh, it can be unpleasant to, to say the least. But if you can control your terror, which is something you can learn to do with sleep paralysis. It offers the perfect conditions to slip out of the body. So in this, at, at this particular time, I decided to do just that. I had learned by trial and error that the best way for me to do this was to sort of sneak out of the body and this gets kind of abstract, so bear with me, but I found I could sort of roll out of my body, like the way one might roll out from under some heavy weight. There's something about this technique that didn't wake my body up, and, and several other conscious explorers have, have found the exact same thing works really well for them for some reason. Uh, it, it's because that, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to avoid waking your body up when you go into this state. So this is such a delicate uh, realm of consciousness that it can be very easy to do something consciously that will that will cause your physical body to just sort of suddenly wake up and that's not what you want because then you're sort of trapped again within the confines of your physical body and so i i slipped out of my body successfully at this point without waking it up and now the center of my consciousness that that's the the point of awareness from which i'm perceiving from is is just off to the side of the foot of my bed so Basically, it's like I was just standing, you know, in the center of my room and I can see my body fast asleep and that all in and of itself is freaky enough if you've never uh, experienced something like that, like witnessing your own body. It's, it is, uh, it's very strange. 
So once you've had enough experiences to realize that this is not just a dream state, this is not just taking place inside your imagination and inside your own head, um, you know, to, to gaze down at your own body alone, it is a it can be a world shattering event because it leaves little possibility that the relationship we've been taught that exists between consciousness and our body has has ever been the truth. But at this point. Uh, the center of my consciousness is still firmly at least in one place at one time. The version of me that some people refer to this as the energy body when you step outside of your physical body. Uh, that, there's a lot of different words for it. And uh, for now, we're going to use the term energy body. So now, while this is happening, uh, off in the distance, I can hear my, my mother is in the kitchen and she's making breakfast. And... So, you know, I kind of decide I'm going to maybe go explore the neighborhood and, uh, you know, I'm going to float off and maybe pass through my bedroom window when I hear this terrible crash and it just booms out from the kitchen. It sounded like my mom dropped every pot and pan in the kitchen onto the floor at the same time. So this crash was so loud that it, it actually startled my physical body awake. Now, had I just been in a normal sleep state, I, I, you know, I just would have jumped up from my bed wondering what the heck that sound was. But it's like this weird, random event my consciousness had never prepared for suddenly happened. And that is, you know, my body was startled awake while my point of awareness was away from it. So I turn in my energy body and I watch my physical body you know, start to wake up. I can, I can see my eyes open and I'm, I'm lifting my head trying to figure out what just happened. And then I saw everything from the perspective of my physical body. You know, I'm starting to just kind of wake up. What the hell was that crash? And instinctively, as I'm waking up in my physical body, I look off to the edge of my bed where I was just standing a moment ago you know, in my, in my energy body, if you will. And of course, there's, there's nothing there. I'm just seeing empty space. So essentially, I went from the perspective of my energy body and then to seeing everything play out through my physical body really quick, uh, in, a, in a quick snap, one right after the other. But then after that, a fraction of a second later, I temporarily experienced both perspectives simultaneously for a moment. Uh, the, uh, the effect only lasted two, three seconds, and then snap, my consciousness was localized again back to my physical body. Uh, this is not something I can even adequately represent with visuals here. It is that abstract. And let me show you exactly what I'm talking about here with, with some illustrations. Consider that if I want to illustrate to you two scenes at once, my options are, well, you know, I can put those images side by side like this, but that was not what I experienced. It's not like these were two perspectives that were, you know, jammed next to each other. You know, my other option is I can show you sort of a dissolve where one image is laid on top of the other, which is closer to what I experienced, but we're still not there yet because I didn't see one perspective laid on top of the other like, like what you're seeing here either. No. I witnessed two fully independent scenes at the same time. So what also was weird for me is that I can't even perfectly recall the memory of what happened in my own imagination. I, I was there, I know what I witnessed, I know what happened to my consciousness, and I can still feel all the terror I felt afterwards. It felt like, it felt like I broke something, I, like I broke something at some fundamental level of my being, like I was temporarily ripped in half. Somehow it felt violent, more violent than anything that could be done to my actual physical body somehow. And it took me days to settle down from just this one event. I, I, I was messed up for, for quite a while after this. Uh, I was afraid to sleep because my lucidity would just kind of kick in spontaneously and I was afraid of what would happen. I, I didn't want to consciously allow myself to enter even another lucid state for years after this. And healing from this experience took the form of 
coming to terms with the fact that this terrible feeling that my soul was somehow violently torn was just another story in my head. And in fact, the only thing that was broken at all was my deep, mostly unconscious preconceptions of what the hell I, I was in the first place. So at the beginning of the show, I tried to emphasize just how important this insight was for me. I had to come to terms with the reality that, look, if, if my point of awareness can be in two places at once, it can probably be in more. Uh, you know, possibly it could be in several at once, maybe an infinite number of places at once. I, I don't really know. But after more experiences with, the, with these phenomena, later I realized that all of my suffering and the terror had to do with a very simple notion that, that perhaps what I really am is not strictly an individual thing at all. So it would be le uh, years later before I started studying quantum mechanics, and one of the first things I learned was that at a fundamental level, the particles that make up our world aren't strictly individual particles that exist in one place at one time. They can also behave as sort of amorphous waves that can be spread over a vast distance. The connections for me were absolutely undeniable when I started doing this, this research. Our nature, at our core, is closer to the description of a wave than it is for an individual particle. And for those of you who have been paying attention, that's actually why I keep using this graphic right here to describe consciousness instead of something more like this. Okay, so what? So we're waves, not particles. What does that change? Why, why, is, that, why is that implication so, so important? I would argue that that perspective changes everything and everyone. Everyone? EVERYONE! Yes. Let's reword the question. What's the difference between identifying as an individual thing that is in one place at one time compared to being some amorphous wave that doesn't have clear boundaries, if, if any at all? I would say that what we imagine we are behind our eyes, looking through these layers of memory and context, dictates how we live our lives. And that includes how we feel, think, behave, plan, how we love, how we fear, everything. Consider that the typical notion of the soul being this point of energy is very pleasing to us for a very specific reason. It doesn't really ask anything of us in terms of change, a, a real ultimate change in philosophy or identity. If we simply replace our identification with an individual physical body that has a beginning and an end that's in one place at one time, with simply another individual thing that is in one place at one time, we never get over the ultimate hurdle that maintains this illusion of I versus them. Consider it that, that that is what is at the heart of the majority of human suffering. The concept that I'm here and these are my boundaries, this is what defines me and everything else, you, him, her, they, are. Everything else is out there, beyond me, different than me, not me. When we are a wave, all of that dissipates, and as scary as that state of awareness may sound, it is pure peace and silence. It is true unity at the core. It's the awareness that ultimately what you are, and I do mean you, the person watching this video right now, is ultimately at the core also what I am. I don't mean that metaphorically, I truly mean that in reality. Now we're connected right now in the moment and we have been forever. In the end, when you stop thinking of yourself as an individual thing and rather as something closer to a wave, conflict and fear no longer make a whole lot of sense to you anymore. All right, so that is our show today. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching. Again, 
Uh, thank you, everyone who has reached out with uh, so many of your really positive comments and uh, questions about what's going on with this series. I, I do appreciate it. I do appreciate uh, all of the likes and the subscribes. That's that's helping me. I'm seeing I'm seeing those numbers go up a little bit. So that helps. That's that helps spread this information. Uh, so uh, it's it's nice to have this kind of information kind of you know get out there a little bit more so than all of the uh, uh, there's a lot of garbage out there believe it or not on the internet so uh, you know when you subscribe this helps boost those numbers a bit and it helps other people have an opportunity to take a look at something different something that's uh, that a lot of people are not really talking about so uh, thanks again for watching I uh, appreciate you for sticking around and again if you have any other questions Ask them in the comments below, or you can reach out to me on uh, any of my social networks, assuming I am not currently banned on, uh, on the social network at the current time. I have a problem with that. <laughs> so uh, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. And for the purposes of this discussion, we're talking about one's consciousness being in two places at once. The notion that the source of your very awareness can be in two places at the same time. And what are the uh, the meh, the meh, what are the meh? Yeah, you haven't thought about that, have you? What are the meh? Well, think about it. That's your homework. <laughs> So at the beginning, yeah, you got that? Think about it.